So, you know, for the last hundred years, this was never a debate before this, but the last hundred years is this huge debate, um, and it's almost like a, a war between faith and science. And I think it, it's, it's a, a poor war to fight. Uh, and really, it was a reaction from the Christian community because of evolution and all kinds of stuff. But there's been like this war going on for 100 years with science. And um, I, my personal belief is that the more we know about science, the more it proves God. It just it proves that this couldn't have just randomly happened, uh, that there was some intelligent design behind this. And it's interesting that um, I science has, has done a lot of great things. And, and I totally believe in science. And I think even just, you know, I, if I have to have surgery, I don't want to go back 100 years where they hand me a stick and a bottle of whiskey. I don't want that. I want to be asleep. I want to be gone. I want to be out. So there's been some great things with it as well. But I always think about technology, how as technology advances, it's a wonderful thing for our life. It really is. I was reading this article where Tesla um, can now, while if you own a Tesla, you while you sleep, Tesla can check your car and see if something's wrong with it. And if something's wrong with it, they will order the parts for you while you sleep. There's, I always wonder if you wake up and you see a $5,000 thing on your credit card, though, like how that's going to go. Uh, it's like, honey, I swear I didn't buy this. Elon made me do it, you know. Uh, but this technology is really cool. I will give you a little heads up on the Teslas, though, that uh, I don't know if they're exactly made for Montana. I was talking to this dude in Lincoln, Montana, and he is a, um, a tow truck guy. They take more Teslas off Rogers Pass because it's 20 below zero up there, and it sucks the batteries down. So fair warning. But technology is amazing. But the problem is, is, is it's, it allows us to take credit for it. It allows us to take credit that we've invented this when really I don't think anything comes close to God's creation, especially the human creation. One strand of DNA, if you actually research this, it's incredible what one strand of DNA really is. There are three billion characters in one cell. And those characters, so remember this word, they mirror each other. So it's one strand, and then it mirrors another strand to make who you are. And it does that 75 trillion times in one cell of the human body. It's incredible, the makeup of us and the creation in human DNA. And so that word mirror is really what I'm going to talk about today. And I was thinking of my kids, and I, my kids are getting older, which is there's some good things to it and some bad things to it. One of the bad things is soon they'll be out of the house, and I'm not going to have any sermon illustrations left. Uh, but the one fun thing about being a dad is you get to start seeing yourself in your kids. Like, you know that they're half of you, and you start seeing little things in them. Like Easton, uh, he does this little smirk. Like when he makes a joke, even if it's not funny, he's like, I make that exact same smirk. So, of course, then it makes me smile. Even no one else gets it. I was like, good one, man. That was a good one, bro. And I don't know if you've seen my son's calves, but he got his calves from his daddy. Uh, I am praying that he gets his hair from his mom for sure. But even my daughter, right? My daughter and I have kind of the same humor, and it's just a ton of fun to see yourself in your children. And I say that because... Uh, again, I brought up that mirror language, that your whole body is a bunch of cells and DNA mirroring each other to make you what you are. And you've heard me say, and it's a resounding theme in the Bible, that you are made in the image of God. And I think so often in the church, we've so focused on the fall, we've focused on the sin, we've focused on the shame, the very first part of the scriptures was God screaming to us, out of all this beautiful creation, out of all the mountain ranges in Montana, out of all the birds, out of all the animals, whatever it is, you are the only creation made in the image of God. And that's important to understand. In Genesis 1.27, it says, so God created the cosmos and all these animals and stuff. And it says, so God created man. Now, that word man is actually humanity. It doesn't just mean body parts. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we're all made in this image of God. And so there's no greater blessing or, or, or thing to know in your life is that you are made in the likeness of the eternal resting father. And after the creation story, it says that God looked at mankind and he says, it is good. 
it is good. That was the original declaration over man. One uh, author writes this. He says, man began in God. You are the greatest idea that God has ever had. Think about that. Out of all the cosmos, out of all the universe, it says you are the greatest thought that ever crossed God's mind. Now, obviously, something went wrong. <laughs> something went wrong. We fell. There's, a, there's the fall of humanity. There's obvious that something is off. But as I look at the creation story, I'm convinced now, and as I have kids now, and I, and I see them doing things sometimes that makes me want to hurt them, but I know that they're made in my image, and I did the same things. I'm convinced that the creation story, that the main reason that we're all screwed up is because really we forgot who we were. That's what sin did. It's lies in our head and in our soul. We forgot who we are. That's why in the creation story, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, it says they went and hid themselves. So not only did they forget who they were, they forget who God was. And they made this whole view of God that he was gonna come and, and hurt them, and so they went and hid. And the very important part in the Genesis account is when God comes to the garden, I believe it was Jesus, but when Jesus comes to the garden, he didn't say, what have you done? Because that's how we always view God. And when you believe that, then you go hide from God. He never said that. He never wagged his finger. He never brought shame. He never brought guilt. He says, where are you? That's what he said to humanity. You have forgotten who I am and you have forgotten who you are. So just like little kids can mirror who you are, we mirror who the Father is. And this mirror language is actually all over the Bible. So, spoiler alert, one of the main points of this message is Jesus Christ came to this planet to show you who you are. He is the perfect human. And when you follow him, you don't become something else, you become more human. Because in the beginning, he says it is good. And he came to redeem that viewpoint of ourselves and God. But listen to how Paul describes this in the New Testament. First, 2 Corinthians 3. He says, But we all, with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror. Because he believed, though the scriptures say, that you are one with God and God is one with you. So when you look in the mirror, you are actually seeing the image of God. Looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And so again, one of my goals today is to show you that the, the birth of Christ, the cross, and the resurrection was to show us who we actually were. It was to show us that this is who you really are. Yes, you do these things, and these things are hurting you, and that's called sin, but that's not who you are designed to be. So as I said last week, this isn't a part of any sermon series or nothing like that. These are just things I've been studying for a while and these are just random sermons. So I just called it random because it's just stuff that I've been praying. What do I need to glean from this and what does the church need to hear? So it's not a part of a series we're gonna bounce around. Uh, but one thing that I haven't done for the last few years is I haven't really gone into the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament if you read it in the full context of what it was. Because there's this constant plan. You see this long-suffering God who's bringing humanity to this certain point. So I love the Old Testament because you just see that no matter what humans did, the plan of God never changed. It never changed. But one of the problems that I do see with the Old Testament, that I do see how it entered the church, because it is, no matter what we want to say, and you've heard me say this before, it's easy to judge the Pharisees in the New Testament. We have Pharisee in us. We have religion in us. And so the problem with how we viewed the Old Testament is we usually start at Moses because Moses gave us the rules and we just want to follow the rules so things go well for us. The problem with that is, is there was an original covenant before Moses. It was an original covenant that was given around 430 years before Moses to a guy named Abram. His real name is Abraham, God gave him a name change, but his first name was Abram. That is the first covenant that is really made with humanity. Now here's the interesting thing about Abram. Abram was not better than anybody else. He was a pagan who worshiped little G gods, that's what I call them, little G gods. He wasn't more righteous than anyone. 
He wasn't more moral than anyone. He wasn't stronger than everybody. He obeyed the Lord. That's all he did. But he was a pagan. Most people think he was a moon worshiper. But with paganism came um, this view that came from the garden of good and evil, the, the tree of good and evil, is what happened when we didn't believe God is now we thought there was this separation between us and God, and so we needed to do these sacrifices, we needed to follow the rules, we needed to create religions in order for us to ascend to God. That is a lie. Remember when it says in Isaiah 9, 6, you all get the Christmas card. For unto us a son is born, to unto us a child is given, and his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not God with Christians, not God with those who've said the prayer, not God with those who've been baptized, not God with those who give their money, not God with those who take communion, God with everyone. And so this covenant that he was making with Abraham is incredibly important. But these gods, little g gods, demanded sacrifices. So these people, you know, in their primitive worldview, they're like, okay, I need some food. There's a God who controls the rain, so if I can give him some of this food, maybe he'll give us more rain. And that's what Abraham thought, that's what the Jews thought, that's what everyone thought, and that what I love about the long-suffering of God is God always enters mankind's religion to bring them out of it. So he calls Abram in the middle of some terrible things that were going on. Because these sacrifices eventually led to a really bad one, child sacrifice. Because what's, what's, what's more important to you that you could give to God so you are blessed? And so all these nations were doing this. And unfortunate, unfortunately, it's still a recent thing. There are still tribes doing this. I read this article about um, a site that they, you know, archeological site that they dug up in Peru. And in Peru, they found 227 children who were sacrificed. And this happened 500 years ago. They write in this article, the Chimu people sacrificed both children and adults for different reasons. But Castillo said in this case, he believes they were killed in hopes it would appease the gods and bring an end to El Nino. A cyclical climate pattern that can result in heavy rainfall and storms on the western coast of South America. His theory is backed up by the fact that soil samples show that the children died during extremely wet season and that they were all facing the sea. 500 years ago, and it's still happening today in sections of Africa. This is why it's important to know that religion is a failure and that Christ finished the job. Because if you don't believe you are connected with God, if you don't think Christ did it, if you think you still need to do a bunch of things, it can lead down some really awful paths. This is why it's important to know you are made in the image of God. But again, God was faithful through all this, and he always meets mankind where he's at. And he tells, to Ab he tells Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to start a whole new thing with you, and out of you, the world will be blessed. So Abraham, though, was still messed up. He had doubts. He was uh, confused. There's this crazy part where Abram goes into a, another land, and it says over and over his wife Sarah was beautiful. So God told him, you just need to obey me. But he goes into this other land, and it says that the king saw Sarah was beautiful and wanted, him, wanted her for his wife. And so Abraham picked up a sword and fought this king. Just kidding. Abraham lied. He goes, yeah, that's my sister. <laughs> Brave Abraham. Yeah, she's pretty good looking, man. She's my sister. You can have her. I'll talk to you later. It's super weird. But that's my point, is Abram was not better than us. He was a human being. He had doubts, but God was faithful to the covenant. So we pick up the story now in Genesis 15. And it says he took him outside, because God could just see that Abraham just wasn't getting it. And he says, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. How many stars are there? How much sand is there? Then he believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He just believed him. You're good. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. But he said, Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? One, I'd be like, you're talking to God. But anyways, 
So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite to each other, okay? So they're mirroring each other. One half, the other half. One half, the other half. One half, they're looking at each other. They're mirroring each other. But he did not cut the birds. And birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Adam drove them away. Funny little detail in the Bible. I have no clue what that means. So you probably know better than me. But here's the thing. Here's one of the issues with Western Christianity. We, we love our justice system. Laws are important. Rules are important. It would be anarchy without it. And we love justice, and that's a, that's, a, that's a godly quality to love justice. But the problem is, is we have taken our Western worldview into God that that's how he views justice, meaning it's always a tipping of the scales. God has to make everything right, and he has to line up the things of justice. And so what that does then is it makes everything about following the rules or not following the rules. God is a God of covenants. He's making covenants with people. That's different than justice. That's different than this. Let me give you one thing that this uh, mentor of mine told me, because I know this is super hard, because we all want justice, and I do not think God turns a blind eye to things. But let me open your mind a little bit. If someone breaks into my house and tries to rape my daughter, I'm going to shoot him. That's justice. But what if it was my son? What if it was your son who was trying to hurt your daughter? Would you have a little different leniency for him? My dear brothers and sisters, that's how God views the entire world. They are his children, and we have to wrestle with that. He has a totally different view of justice. God's justice is not just to bring justice for the perpetrator or for the victim, but also to, to restore the perpetrator. That's full restoration. And so when we read this passage, we, we miss that this covenant is important. In the Old Testament, in those times, a covenant was a binding agreement between two people. And usually it was a binding agreement between two tribes. This was a huge deal. This was like a legal document back then. I don't know if they like, whoops, I don't know if they spit in their hands and shook hands or whatever it is, I don't know. But a covenant was a big deal. The thing that makes it so big is what you were saying is, I cut this half up, you cut that half up. If you break this covenant, the blood will be on your head. So if you broke a covenant back in the day, it cost you your life. You were saying, this is on me. This covenant is on me to fulfill. So again, though, in this passage, what did it say? Before the covenant, before the rules, before Moses, it said, Abraham believed God and it was accredited him to righteousness. He just believed God was good. That is why faith is the most important thing. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, and without, and this is in the New Testament, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. Some of y'all are running around thinking if you give more money or you do more things or you stop sinning or this or this or that, then you'll please him. It says you cannot please him without faith. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and he proves to be one who rewards those who seek him. It doesn't say he rewards those who sacrifice for him, who give money, who do this, who serving kids in the zoo, who whatever it is. It never says that. It says he rewards those who seek him. So let me put it this way. Faith is what pleases God because you're saying, I believe you finished the job and you're the one who does it. I trust you. That's what faith is. But the sacrifices in the Old Testament were not meant to save them. It was to prove they were saved. God calls Abraham out, gives him a covenant. He believed it. Moses and the Jews are saved from Egypt, and then they're given the law. And what we've done in American Christianity is we have flipped that, that if you follow the law or you follow these rules, then it proves you're saved. That is a shredding of the cross of Jesus Christ. That is a shredding of the covenants that God has made with humanity. 
I forgot to share this video, but I'll just tell you what it was. Down the street from our house, there's this rope swing. And uh, Easton loves going on it, and he's getting crazier and crazier and crazier on it, and I love it, because that's my mirror image going to hurt himself for fun. That's exactly what I was about. And so he's getting higher and higher, and I was thinking the other day watching this, and now I'm doing slow-mo shots of him, and he's like pointing back. It's just a great time. If my son hits his head in the water, am I gonna yell at him? You need to believe the right things for me to come get you. Son, do you believe in me perfectly? Do you have all the rules? Do you have all the regulations? Do you have the right religion? Have you done the right sacrifices? No, I'm jumping in and I'm getting him. Now, when I pull him out of the water, what if he just, what, he just has faith? He's like, you saved me. You're a good dad. And then, what if he goes to the store and buys me a new pair of Jordans to thank me? I'm gonna take them. Because that was him honoring me for helping him. But it wasn't why I saved him. I already saved him because I'm his father. So faith reveals this gift that has been given to us. We always think faith, believing in Jesus, is a transaction. The cross happened. The resurrection happened. Faith is kicking in a reality that's already there. It's already there. Christ has saved you. He's defeated death in Hades. And when you have faith in that, then you walk in reality. I always say this with people who kind of try to make divisions on this. Does my son Easton have to confess to me that I'm his dad and he's a clout? That's my last name. Does he have to come to me and be like, you're my father and I'm a clout? No! He is my son and he's a clout. But he can grow up someday and be like, you're not my dad and I'm not a clout. And then I'm gonna grab his little collar on his neck. No. And he can live his life thinking he's not my son and he's not a clout. It doesn't matter. The reality is, he's my boy and he's a clout. That's the difference with faith. Faith is believing in something that's already done. And here's the cool thing. That word in Greek, oh. <laughs> that word in Greek means it's only used once in the Bible, right here. So when it says that God rewards those who passionately seek him, that word means a wage that is freely given. When you believe the good news of God's love and you believe you're made in his image and you believe that Jesus died on the cross, you are just believing in a gift that was freely given. And you know what God gives you? Himself. He gives you himself. Jesus didn't say, I give you life. He says, I am the life. And when you believe the good news and you believe you're mirrored in his image, you begin to know who you are because the Father is speaking it to you instead of the world, instead of the internet, instead of politicians, instead of whatever. The Father starts speaking that truth to you. So this is a great scene, right? He's got it all lined up. You got, okay, and Abraham's like, okay, I'm gonna fill my side of the covenant because this is what we do in the world, right? You got your cut-up heifer, I got my cut-up heifer. Well, here's what it says. Now it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, a smoking oven and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between the pieces. Abraham was asleep, guys. While this whole religious transaction was going down, Abraham did nothing. He woke up and cut the crust out of his eyes. He's like, what is happening right now? There's like a flaming torch and something going on. And it says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Canaanite, the Kenizzites, the and the Canaanites, so... You can't say them either, whatever, just because I'm a pastor, you can't say them. <laughs> you all know you've been reading it, been like, oh, dear God. <laughs> all right, so here's the point. Everybody who, th who thinks that, that you need to do something as a transaction for God to save you, what did Abraham do here? Nothing. Nothing. He fell asleep. 
He wakes up, there's a flaming torch going through the middle of it. I'm sure, like us, he's like, hey, what can I do? Nothing. So let me put it this way. We always think this is a transaction. If that's true, then you save yourself. This is the first covenant ever made with humans. And God said, y'all are gonna fail in this. You will never be able to keep this covenant. You'll never be able to do it. I'm going to keep it for you. And if I don't keep it, the blood is on my head. This is the first covenant with humanity. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're trying to buy a house right now. Good luck in Missoula, Montana, by the way. And you finally find one. And you, you show up because you gotta sign all the papers. If you've ever bought a house recently, there's like 35,000 pages you have to sign. And you show up and you're excited. And when you flip it open, you see that your dad has already signed the papers. And so you flip to the next one. And you sign next to it, he's a co-signer, but he's already signed it and you flip it. 8,000 pages later, the house is yours. And you get to the bottom part and it says what you owe. And it says zero balance. So you go to your dad, and you're like, dad, that's amazing, that's awesome. But the house is in your name too, so what do I have to do? What do I have to do? And he's like, it's in both our names. But the house is paid for. It's already done. You owe nothing. But it's in both our names. So, okay, so what do I do? Dad, I mean, what do I do? There's gotta be a catch here, right? There's gotta be a catch. And he's like, here's what you do, son. You enjoy it. You believe it's your house. But you know what you could do? You could invite other people over to enjoy this house. You could invite other people over to, sh to, to know how good your father is. Let me ask you, what kind of freedom would you have if you actually believed that it was paid for and free? And better yet, how would you talk about your daddy? See, the Christian faith is always like, yeah, I mean, yeah, he paid for it, but you need to do this, 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 and this, or else dad's gonna burn you. You know that sounds ridiculous now. You know that. Instead, it's paid for. Believe it's paid for. And people can be like, well, I don't want to move in. Well, you're lost, man, because it's paid for. That's the first covenant with humanity. What Jesus, what God was saying in this covenant, you can never keep it in the first place. Remember when Moses walks off the mountain? He's got the Ten Commandments, or we don't even know what they were, the first ones. It says God wrote him with his finger. He's coming off the mountain like, all right, I can't wait to give people the rules because they're a bunch of weirdos and we gotta keep them in check. And they come down and they're having a big orgy and they're worshiping a golden calf. Moses is like, smashes the tablets. So what does God do? He takes him back up on the mountain. And it says, this is interesting. It says the first ones God wrote with his finger. The second ones, he handed Moses the chisel. That's important. Moses was never supposed to lose his temper and smash those. Those are written by the finger of God. But you know what I think the real point of that whole story is? He didn't even give them the rules yet and they still were screwing up. They hadn't even, he hadn't even flipped them over in the big reveal party. The law and religion, and your works, and your money, and your sacrifice was never going to save you, ever. If anything, if you don't believe God has fulfilled the covenant, you're gonna screw everything up. And you're gonna be living in a house paying rent that's already paid for. That's why this covenant is so important. You will fail, and when you do, God was saying, but the blood's on my hands. It's on my hands. So this is where it gets good. He didn't cut up the birds for some reason. I looked into it, no one has an answer for it. <laughs> but I do know this, that his, Jesus' mother, Mary and Joseph, they were poor and they sacrificed a turtle dove. So I think there's a connection there, but I don't know why he didn't sacrifice it. However, back then, these three animals were the highest form of sacrifice. It represented sin, guilt, and fellowship. But again, what did Abraham do? Nothing. He was asleep. 
That is so important because if we focus on the sacrifices and the law and these animals, we're gonna think that God demands all these things. The first covenant, God said, I don't demand anything, believe the good news. Abraham, sacrifices, law, never saved them. Christ saves you. Jesus saves you. So I think that number three is important, okay? I think the number, I think I love numbers in the Bible and stuff too, like the six, the day six is the day of man, it's like the death day, but then day seven is the resurrection. Those numbers are important, it's super important. I think, this is just me, that number three is important because it represents the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are the mirror image of God and you are made in his image. You are his likeness, and you are three things in one. You are body, mind, and spirit. I've used this example so many times, but it works every time. You ever watch a movie and you cry? Why? It's not happening to those people. Every time, man, Forrest Gump, when he sees his son, I'm like, is he like me? <laughs> right? You're like, oh. Tom Hanks didn't have a son like that, <laughs> okay? That proves the soul. You ever been thinking to yourself, like in your mind, and you're like, you're having this full out conversation with yourself, and then you don't do what you thought you were gonna go do. What is that? You are body, mind, and spirit. You are made in the image of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, God is three persons in one. They're totally unified, but totally distinct. Let me tell you how that works. I don't know. I have no idea. That's the mystery that we follow. It makes perfect sense, but no sense at all. And I'm okay with it. But I think that number three is important because he's saying, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's bringing all of it together. And he faces them face to face. They're mirroring each other. And then he walks through. And I believe what God is saying in the first covenant is these two halves will become one with me. They become one with me. That's why Romans says, for from him and through him and to him all are all things. To him be the glory forever. Colossians 1.17, this is one of my favorites. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. So picture these things that are separate and God goes through the middle of them saying, I hold this covenant together. What I love about this story again is because Abraham was nothing really special, he just had faith. And wherever you land, whatever your doubts are, whatever your concerns are, whatever your sins are, the point of the first covenant is it's already done, God has taken care of it. It's on God to save man. So believe the good news. Maybe you're asleep, wake up. Wake up, you mirror God. He's speaking to who you are. You're believing lies about yourself. And here's the thing that, that I need to dive into real quick. Because in this passage, we have made this passage just about the Jews. And we say that the Jews are God's chosen people. And I explained this last week. Yes, but not because they were better than anybody or more righteous. God needed one bloodline for the Messiah to come out of. But I have heard American evangelicals say, see, you mess with Israel, God messes with you. Because this passage is about Israel. This passage is about Jesus Christ. So let me give you a wide lens here. In Galatians 3, Paul, the Jew of Jews, says this. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, his seed. We've read that passage as his seeds, the Jews, his seed, Christ. He does not say, and to seeds, as one would in referring to many, but rather as in referring to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. The Jews failed miserably on what their calling was to share the good news of God without the earth. So Christ fulfilled it for them. Every promise to the Jews has already been fulfilled in Christ, in Christ. So what I am saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant 
previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of promise. What he's saying is following the rules was never going to fix this. Following the rules was never going to save you. Long before Moses, long before the law, he made a promise with Abraham, and that promise was to the entire world. The entire world was the promise. Through Christ. Good behavior, good religion, whatever it is, never please God seeing that Christ has accomplished this and seeing that you are one with Christ is what pleases God. And I can tell you, the more you follow Christ, the more exciting it becomes. I know less now than I ever did, but I know him. And I was talking to Ben Stewart yesterday on the phone. He's the guy from Uncharted, the missionary group that we support. And I said, it's really weird as you get older following Jesus because I feel like I'm always chasing after him and I know I already have him. It's like this constant chasing. But the more you see Christ, the more you follow Christ, the more you submit to Christ, the more you start seeing who you truly are. And this is why believing that God finishes the job. It's his covenant. It's his promise. It's a reality. Believe the good news. There's nothing you're going to do. Absolutely nothing you can do to contribute to this. Because he said, through the seed, the stars of heaven, the sands of the seashore, will be brought into this covenant and promise. So here's the deal. Here's the beauty of following Jesus and seeing you're made in his image. Jesus was the perfect human. We screwed up. We have lived in a fallen identity. Jesus came to show us who we actually are. And I've told you this before. That's why some of you are wrestling with sins and you're struggling with things. That's not who you are. That's something you do. Who you are is Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, all of us. You mirror the image of Christ. And all your little quirks and all the little personality traits you have, Jesus has those too. And if we could all just see that, it would bring this beautiful tapestry of the glory of God and the personality of God. Jesus is the perfect human. He came to show us what humanity really looks like because in the garden, God says it is good. And then we screwed up and Jesus said it's still good. Jesus made a covenant with humanity. He walked through these two sides. And what he was saying is, I fulfilled this covenant. The blood's on me. And thousands of years later, Jesus dies on a cross and proves that the covenant was on him. So let me end it with this. Ben, come on up. I love what one man writes. He says, the distance caused by Adam's fall compared to the distance between heaven and earth is canceled in the incarnation. When Jesus Christ took on humanity, all of humanity, that distance was canceled. It's over. It's finished. So picture this scene. What I believe was going on here, because Jesus said, Abraham looked forward to my day. You got these two sides and they're facing each other. And the light of the Lord goes through. And I think it's a picture of the cross. That I am bridging the gap between you and the Father. And everything that my Father is, you are. And everything you are, my Father is. You image God. And it's a restoring of bringing those two things together. John 14, 20. This is such a huge verse for me. He says, on that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. One of the great early church fathers said, the cosmos is an appearance of God. Do I believe scientists, when they look at all that stuff, they see God? I bet they do. Creation screams the glory of God. It screams it. The cosmos is an appearance of God. Humanity is the image of God. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God. 
So what they would do when the law of Moses was introduced is they would take these sacrifices and they would give it to the priest to eat. So I'll be taking an offering at the door today when you guys go out. Just playing. In the New Testament, Peter said, you're all priests. You're all kings and priests because of the death of Jesus Christ and the reuniting of us with, with God. So today, when you grab communion, when you walked in, you are not celebrating the Moses covenant alone. You are celebrating the Abraham covenant where God says, you're never gonna keep it. The blood's on me. I'll keep it for you. And that is why Romans says there's no height nor depth nor anything in this cosmos that can separate you from the love of God. And so today, when you take that communion and you swallow that, you are acknowledging, you are professing that you are one with Christ and you are acknowledging that you are made in the image of God. And this will change everything because when we can see, we mirror him. You know that John 1 says the Father and the Son stand face to face with each other? That means they see the whole universe through the lens of each other's eyes. And they see you as made in the image of God. And so you take this bread and you take this wine and you say, you ingest it and say, I am one with the Father, I am united with Jesus, and I mirror his image. And that is where real change comes. When you can see, that's not me, that's something I'm doing, but what I really am is Christ. That's when real change comes. So let me be just super blunt here. There is no transaction with God. God fulfilled the first covenant, and it pointed to Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ said he defeated death and Hades, and all you need to do is believe the good news, and it says it is accredited to you as righteousness. So my dear friends, you mirror the image of God. Believe this good news. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.